The Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game debuted in North America on March 8, 2002 with the first core set, Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon. The official card game, Japan's equivalent to the TCG, debuted about three years prior in February of 1999. Or at least, that's what the lizard people of Konami would want you to believe. On April 4th, 1998, the Bandai Company debuted a new physical card game for the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise after acquiring a merchandise production license from the entity that created the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, Toei Animation. Over the next six months, Bandai would release three sets of Yu-Gi-Oh! trading cards under the name Yu-Gi-Oh! Bandai's official card game. Totaling 121 cards, most of these truly original cards would translate to both Japan's OCG and North America's TCG, keyword being most. To date, there are 15 monsters from Bandai's original card game that have in no way been incorporated to either the OCG or the TCG. These are the lost cards of Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu-Gi-Oh! Bandai's official card game was a vastly different experience from the juggernaut of a card game that we know of today. There were 13 rules, some of which were emulated in the OCG and TCG, but several are far removed from today's game in every aspect. Interesting fact, these 13 rules were loosely treated like key terms. For monster cards that didn't have unique effects, one of these 13 rules were printed as their card text, as opposed to the flavor text that we get from the modern normal monster. First Generation was the first set of the Bandai Yu-Gi-Oh card game, and this set holds two monsters that were never brought to the modern era. Armored Basic Insect with Laser Cannon. Yeah, the novel length of card names has been a trend since day zero. So obviously, we've had the two halves of this card in the modern game since the beginning. Basic Insect and Insect Armor with Laser Cannon. But the combination of the two is something we've only seen in the anime and the manga. The second lost card from the first generation is Aphrodite. This one's a great example of how distinguished the art style is from Bandai's game when compared to the modern game. No lollies here, only big mommy vibes. The second generation, and you guessed it, was the second Bandai set, actually didn't have any unique cards from the modern game. So, we'll move right along to Gen 3, Yu-Gi-Oh! Ruby and Sapphire. The third generation was released on October 10th, 1998, and contains the final 13 lost cards of Yu-Gi-Oh! And things get a little more interesting here because some of these cards have special effects, and we can take a look at what could have been considered meta for the original game. Our first two cards are Golden Pegasus and King Rex. Again, great examples of art style for Bandai Yu-Gi-Oh! It really has that old school anime feel to it. And you can kind of see where some of these cards would draw inspiration for future cards that we would see in the modern game. The next four cards are the first example of special effects in the game, at least with the card pool that we're looking at. Yellow, Red, and Violet Hecate all share the same effect text of the following. When you gather the goddess triplets of wickedness in play, the card Gorgon can be played. Why are they speaking in fortune cookie? I can gather that this would translate to if you control all three of the Hecates, you'd be able to special summon this card Gorgon. But they worded it in the most philosophical way possible. The monster card Gorgon basically restates the effect text of the Hecate cards, but also includes the ability to attack three times consecutively. Can we bring the word consecutively to the modern game? Feels classy. King Beetle, Rock Gun, Night Soldier, Neon Knight, Chimera, and Dark Zorla bring us through all but one of our remaining lost cards. All cards without special effects and simply have one of the 13 game rules printed as their card text. I still can't understate how amazing the artwork for this version of the game was. If Konami, by some miracle, did decide to import these cards into the modern game, I would love to see the original artwork make the final cut. And before we touch on our final card, I do want to mention another small group of cards from Bandai's game that never saw light in Konami's game. Character cards, which all had unique effects in addition to one of the 13 game rules in their card text, as well as the three-body connection Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon. 
I'm not considering these cards as lost to the game because we don't have a modern equivalent to the character cards, and the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon is more so a novelty of the game itself and not a mainstay throughout. But our 15th and final lost card of Yu-Gi-Oh is no mere monster, but a spell. Dragonic Pulse of the Land. Boy, that sounds like a great support card for the vast amount of dragon monsters in this game. What's the effect? You can increase the attack strength of a fiend type monster plus 800. Huh? I do like the idea of the optional stat increase, like you would play this card and choose to not increase the attack of your fiend type monster, but that does it. Those are the 15 lost cards of Yu-Gi-Oh! So now, we know of every physical card for the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Starting from the absolute beginning. <laughs> These are the lost cards of Yu-Gi-Oh! Part 2. On January 20th, 1999, Bandai would release their final Yu-Gi-Oh! branded product. A sealed ass containing 43 sticker cards. And around this time, Konami of Japan had acquired the exclusive rights to the Yu-Gi-Oh! brand, releasing two video games, Monster Capsule Breed and Battle, and Duel Monsters. These video games had a combined set of 21 promotional cards, which more closely resembled what today's game would become. The Monster Capsule video game for the PlayStation contained 10 cards, 7 of which, just like Bandai's game, were never imported to the OCG or the TCG. None of these cards had any semblance of effect text or typing, unlike the Bandai game, as these 21 cards were only meant to be promotional pieces for the video games and not a fully realized playable card game. Batty, a level 4 monster with 900 attack and 1250 defense. Demonis, a level 6 monster with 1800 attack and 1200 defense. Dinosaur Wing, a level 5 monster with 1500 attack and 700 defense. Ironoid, a level 5 monster with 1100 attack and 900 defense. And according to the Yu-Gi-Oh! wiki, this card's name is a pun of the words I and iron. I don't know if that's Japanese humor, <laughs> but if it is, we need a new Japan immediately. Red Scorpion, a level 5 monster with 1300 attack and 900 defense. Spyro, I mean, the runner lizard, a level 4 monster with 800 attack and defense. And finally, Sonic Eye, a level 5 monster with 1200 attack and 1000 defense. As far as the stats of these monsters go, you can see the early works of what would be the first sets of both the TCG and the OCG, with levels matched with attack and defense spread that, by today's standard, would be laughable at best. The artwork, though, raises some questions. Included in the 10-card promotional set was the Blue-Eyes White Dragon and Mystical Elf, whose artwork would directly translate to the modern game. But the art style of the Seven Lost Cards is quite a stark contrast. Even the monster card Zork, which isn't technically lost as it would become Dark Master Zork in the TCG, had a completely different artwork than what would be used in Konami's final adaptation of the game. Make no mistake, I do admire the simplistic and almost video game-esque art style of these lost cards. It makes sense for the media it was released with because they do look like they were ripped straight from an old PlayStation game. Especially Runner Lizard probably why it was lost to history. And if there are no further objections, now we can say that we've covered the complete 22 lost cards of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. Perhaps there is still a glimmer of hope that these cards will someday resurface in the modern game. But that's going to wrap up today's discussion, guys. Let me know your thoughts. Drop a comment down below. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated as always, guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV, signing off.